Because right now, let's break it down. Uh, we have the former assistant director of the FBI, Ron Hosko. He is joining us to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and Ron, we've been talking with our panel uh, about the FBI director's rationale for taking the notes, these meticulous notes that is forming the basis of the statement that he released yesterday and will form the basis of his testimony. Take us into the mind of an FBI agent, a senior FBI agent, why notes are taken, why they are or perhaps not shared with other members of the FBI and perhaps with their superiors. Well, good morning, Vlad. Uh, first, it's common for FBI leaders and other leaders in government to take notes. I did it routinely. I had a ledger book that I took to uh, high-level meetings. And, and very often you see people all, the, all around the table jotting notes on substantive points of a briefing, of a conversation. And what are the takeaways? What are the do-outs, as we used to say? What, what has to get done? What's the follow-up? Uh, here, this is a little bit different. Um, and I would think that, uh, and as, as the director, the former director seems to define it, he was troubled by the content of these conversations. Um, had this been, uh, you know, he's, I'm sure, in conversations or had been in conversations with uh, General Mattis, with General Kelly uh, at, uh, over at DHS, and on a number of things about how the FBI interacts with Customs and Border Protection or with the Defense Department. And it could be that they're having innocuous explanations of how our organizations interface with each other. But here you're talking about somebody who is in a position to fire the FBI director um, in a conversation with him or conversations about his personal loyalty and who that loyalty ought to be to or what it ought to be to and about uh, someone who is the subject of FBI inquiry. And the president perhaps uh, wishing, uh, and I think in a light most favorable to him, we could argue, someone could argue, that the president was merely wishing out loud. He did not direct, he did not command, but still that is a troubling conversation with the head of an agency that is supposed to be independent. And I think that's what drove Jim Comey to get in his car and start typing notes. But yet, Ron, uh, it has been reported that when President Obama appointed uh, Jim Comey to the position of FBI director, he said something like, this is probably the last time you and I are together in a room uh, because obviously the independence of the FBI director and the executive branch is something that is paramount uh, in this republic. And yet... The director took those nine meetings and calls with the president over the course of several months. People are going, people who are, are perhaps uh, troubled by that are going to say, look, that does seem in itself troubling. Why would the FBI director take so many meetings with the president if, as he has pointed out and as you're pointing out, he perhaps felt uncomfortable with what the president was asking? Well, first, uh, the, the president, uh, Jim Comey, is in his chain of command. So... Seldom are you given a you know, great opportunity to say, no, I don't think I'm going to go over to the White House today. Uh, you know, in, the, in our post-9-11 world, Bob Mueller was over at the White House on a regular basis on, on terrorism briefings and on a range of other issues. But it just gets into very tricky territory when the conversation starts to focus on something that is uh, an ongoing investigative matter within the FBI and conversations with the president. And there are policies in place within DOJ to prevent that sort of thing. But remember, too, we had a DOJ that was, you know, in a little bit of chaos as well. We did not at that time have, I, I think, an acting, we didn't have an attorney general. Jeff Sessions had not yet been confirmed when some of this started. Sally Yates was effectively on her way out of the door as the acting, or as a, uh, the acting attorney general and the DAG at that time. And another gentleman, Dana Bente, was over as the actor within DOJ. So there was, you know, kind of some moving parts within DOJ while this was happening. And Jim Comey, I think, did the prudent thing, write it down as, he, as his concerns started to grow. All right, uh, Ron, stand by. Uh, I want to get some final thoughts uh, from our political panel here and our reporters. Uh, so, Caitlin, what are you going to be looking for as we await the moment that Jim Comey takes to that stand? What questions remain unanswered for you? Well, a couple of things. One is the question, of course, of why didn't you bring this up earlier? Another question, too, is, uh, you know, the, the details of Comey's testimony and of the way in which he answers questions are going to be significant here. And it will also give us an idea of, while he might not be able to make a uh, 
judgment about this. Uh, the, for, he's a good lawyer, right? He's a former prosecutor. He's been in this system for a long time. He also really knows how to testify and how to make uh, some newsworthy points. So what he chooses to say and what he chooses to say, well, I can't really talk about that. That's in the realm of the Mueller investigation will be really interesting because the two have talked and they are friends. They have longtime partners. I think that will be interesting. Zerlina, for you, uh, this for a lot of people will not be the nail in the coffin, right. but perhaps provide a nail mm -hmm. for Robert Mueller. What's your take? What are you looking for? What do you expect to hear? I, I think a lot of folks are, are looking um, to Comey's testimony uh, to, to rebut um, some of the talking points we can uh, expect from Republicans today. You know, the RNC um, talking points leaked last night um, to reporters, and I think that, you know, putting his testimony out yesterday in paper form, essentially to preview uh, what he's going to say to hopefully help the senators ask some more relevant questions um, and not overly politicize today's hearing, but also making sure to address um, and, and sort of get a heads up on what to expect in terms of uh, the counterattack so he can address everything and, and I think leave the American people with a full understanding of what took place. On the flip side, Leslie, there are a lot of people who are going to say, uh, look, uh, the president has been vindicated. Uh, he was not himself the target of the investigation. Uh, Jim Comey has inserted himself into the political process one too many times. There are lawmakers on both sides sides of the aisle who were unhappy with uh, the decisions that he made with regards to the election. So victory for the president. Uh, I would say it's going to be the tale of two testimonies. You have both um, kind of your diehard, uh, true Trump loyalists who are going to argue those points exactly that were that were leaked. You know, this, there, there's no evidence of collusion between you know, Russia and the president's uh, the campaign. Let's move forward on the president's agenda. But then there's a safeguard that's going to look at two things. One being oversight. Yes, there's independence at the FBI, but there is congressional oversight that seems to be completely disregarded at this moment. There were many protocols and mechanisms that Comey. Could could have taken if he felt this, that he wanted to alert Congress. Um, and and it, there's a fair point, he could have been terminated for that. But where does this thread, if you're pulling it, where does it end? Just like a true telenovela, we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Remains to be seen. So, so for you, Ricky, um, looking at this from the legal, with the legal eye, what questions remain unanswered? What do you expect Robert Mueller will be able to glean from this testimony? Well, I think we need to know not only precisely what the president said and when he said it, but we also need to know how Jim Comey received it. What did he think the president meant? And as a result of any statement that the president made, what did Jim Comey do or not do? So this is what building a case is all about. Another sidelight to this, which is perhaps beyond my legal expertise, but it certainly is involved in when I think about reputations of lawyers in the law, this is a possibility of the day of the rehabilitation of James Comey's reputation. This is his opportunity. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, do we still have Ron Hosko with us real quick? Ron, we've got about two minutes left. Uh, I just want to ask you, the president announced via Twitter yesterday uh, who he intends to nominate as the next director of the FBI, a lawyer who doesn't really have a lot of national uh, security experience, Christopher Wray, um, doesn't know a lot of the rank and file FBI agents. What's your take? Do you think that he will be able to raise the morale, which what we understand right now at the FBI is uh, not at its best? Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about this nomination. Uh, by, in looking at his bio, he has significant complex uh, investigative and uh, prosecutive experience on, on complex financial crimes, on public corruption matters. Uh, and so I think someone with his depth and his prior relationships with the FBI, uh, which, I, which I've been personally told have been very positive, um, both in Washington, D.C. and as a prosecutor down in Atlanta, um, I think he'll, he'll be warmly embraced by the, by the workforce there who will, you know, very much be in a wait-and-see mode. They want to see what they get as an FBI director. It's a big job. It's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of focus, um, particularly to pull the FBI back out of this spotlight that most do not want to be in. At the very least, uh, it may be something that both Republicans and Democrats can agree on. Somebody who comes from outside of the political world, uh, does not have a lot of baggage. Uh, we'll be watching for that very, very soon. Uh, Ron Hosko, former assistant director of the FBI, we thank you so much for your analysis. As always, I want to thank the rest of our panel. Uh, Caitlin Huey-Burns, thank you. Ricky Clemens, Erlina Maxwell, Leslie Sanchez.